Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Finance Simplified, the official podcast for Street Fins. We're here to break down the world of finance for you to understand from a relatable perspective with discussions with experts. This is episode 19, and today I have Alex Patel with me again. How have you been since our last episode? Hey Rohan, I've been doing great. How are you doing? I've been doing well. I've got some midterms in the next few days, but after that, I'll be freed up a lot more. Good to hear. Time to start enjoying some nice weather. For sure. So Alex, April, which is when this episode releases, is Financial Literacy Month. And in that spirit, we want to release our transcripts of our episodes to all of our loyal listeners. We have all of them ready, and we'll be sharing them with those who filled out the feedback form in the description. These transcripts contain a wealth of simplified financial wisdom from all our past all-star guests. So if you want to receive our past and future transcripts, fill out the feedback form and we'll email them to you. We also want to remind you to follow us on social media at StreetFins on Twitter and Instagram for updates and to sign up for our newsletter Finance Simplified for simplified weekly recaps, finance tips, updates, and more. Also, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, we would love for you to join our clubhouse club, Finance Simplified. So Alex, the topic of today's episode is simplifying quantitative finance. Why is this such an important topic to know about? Well, Rohan, finance is a field that can be approached in a variety of ways. One of those ways is through a heavier emphasis on data and numbers, which is the approach quantitative finance uses. And while all finance deals with numbers, quantitative finance is a field that uses mathematics and quantitative analysis in its own way, as compared to qualitative and more fundamental finance and investing. This is an approach that has become increasingly popular relatively recently. Right. Quantitative finance may seem complicated, and at times the math can be, but when you break it down, it has some very simple principles. For those who haven't heard of quantitative finance, it's really quite simple to understand. Before we continue, I want to give a shout out to Joseph Lai for correctly guessing this topic's guest. Joseph is from Los Angeles and studies business administration at the University of Southern California. So Joseph, awesome job on figuring out who it was and sending us your guest so quickly. We'll be teasing the next guest at the end of part two. Additionally, we just want to remind you that if you're learning from our episodes and want to keep supporting what we're doing, we'd be eternally grateful if you gave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Additionally, we'd really love to know what feedback you have for us, so fill out the feedback form in the description to let us know how we're doing and what you would like to see from us going forward. Feel free to send any thoughts and ideas you have to fspodcast at streetfins.com. This part one episode will go into the basics of quantitative finance, the history of quantitative finance, common misconceptions, how quantitative finance approaches risk management, and much more. Our guest was the former chief risk manager at AQR and is one of the most well-known and well-regarded quantitative finance experts out there. So let's just get to simplifying. From the minds of the students at StreetFins, this is Finance Simplified, the podcast that simplifies the seemingly complex and confusing world of money. I'm your host, Rohan Gupta. Quantitative finance has been popular in the news in all sorts of ways. In the world of quantitative finance. Quantitative finance. Quantitative finance. Our guest today is Aaron Brown, and he's the former chief risk manager at AQR, one of the largest and most successful hedge funds on Wall Street. He's one of the smartest, most involved people in quantitative finance today, as he's not only worked extensively in the field, but he's also taught it as a professor and through his books. His background and career are both so impressive that I think I'll just let him introduce himself. Sure, Ryan. Thanks for having me. My name is Aaron Brown, and I've been interested in finance really my whole life and always from a quantitative perspective. That is, I love to look at the numbers and look for patterns and try and figure things out. Now, I was born in the 1950s, and academics were just beginning to study finance in a serious quantitative way. And Financial practice had no room for mathematicians. It wasn't until the late 70s, early 1980s that it was acceptable on Wall Street to admit you knew some math. But the quants came into Wall Street at that time, and I was among that early generation. We really changed things completely. The whole way finance is run was completely redesigned from the ground up. There was a real revolution. There are many different kinds of quantitative people who went into finance. I came from an early group, and we were really quantitative gamblers. We were people who had honed our skills in Las Vegas with blackjack, poker, sports betting. We were very much in the mindset of beating the market. The original 
person for that was a math professor by the name of Ed Thorpe, who invented blackjack card counting and a lot of other things, and has one of the most impressive hedge fund records. He started in the early 60s, but he was a complete anomaly. There just weren't many people like that. Then in the 1980s, we get different kinds of quants coming in. We got a huge influx of physicists at the end of the Cold War because suddenly nobody needed physicists to build nuclear bombs, either for the U.S. or the Soviet Union, and the big superconducting super collider project got canceled. So we just got a flood of physicists, and they were very different. They used different kinds of math, and they didn't have the kind of gambling, beat the market attitude. Their attitude was kind of understand the fundamental reality and build systems. Moving into the late 1990s, early 2000s, we see computer people. So we've got a whole new kind of quantitative person coming in. And so we've got a whole bunch of different kinds of people doing different quantitative things in finance. If you talk about quantitative finance, you're really talking about a lot of different areas. And essentially, all of finance is quantitative now. There are qualitative investors. There are people like Warren Buffett or David Einhorn who pick stocks primarily based on fundamental analysis and qualitative analysis and meeting people and thinking things through. But even those kinds of finance are heavily quantitative. And the part I come from, the AQR Capital Management, a fund that I worked at for 10 years, it's entirely quantitative. Yeah. And you gave us pretty much a timeline of the evolution of quantitative finance and sort of your background. Now, I'd love to know a little bit about what exactly quantitative finance is and its applications. So what would a quant be doing? What are some of the applications today, maybe, in a fund where you worked at, such as AQR or other big ones, such as Citadel? What exactly do quants do and what exactly does quantitative finance mean today? Well, I would say the basic thing you're trying to do in quantitative finance today is come up with profitable investments. And quants tend to use systems. So it's algorithmic investing. They tend to be highly diversified. So if you're a traditional fundamental stock picker using qualitative information, you have to do a tremendous amount of work on each company. You know, you talk to the management, you try the product, you talk to suppliers, customers, regulators, and you make a qualitative judgment. And you might end up buying 10 stocks. And you better hope that eight of those 10 are successful because you don't have a lot of diversification. A quant strategy, by contrast, tends to buy a huge number of stocks. So at AQR, you know, we might have a fund that had 2,000 long stocks and 2,000 short stocks that were very carefully vetted to be almost exactly offsetting in risk. So there's very little residual risk. And out of that, we might hope that 51% of our longs went up and 51% of our shorts went down. So we're counting on diversification to make up for the fact that we cannot be anywhere near as accurate as a qualitative investor. We're making our investment decisions or the computer is making them for us based on a few accounting numbers, a few bits of data here and there, and it's making rapid evaluations of thousands of companies, something you just can't do with any great accuracy. But the diversification you get reduces your risk to the point where that can be a much more attractive sharp ratio or not. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But when it works, it can be a much more attractive sharp ratio than a qualitative investor. Another big area of quant that is not so sought after after more is derivative pricing. So that used to be in the 1990s, early 2000s, that was a very, very big area. Entirely different kind of math, entirely different kind of goal. Trading algorithms, that's more of a computer science type of quantitative. So people who are trying to design either high-frequency trading systems to make profits or systems that execute your trades very efficiently. Big data, <clears throat> machine learning, those are really growing areas of quant where people are applying them, again, primarily to make good investments, but also for predicting macro events and that sort of thing. So I'd say those are the main areas of quantitative finance. And the biggest one, the one I started with, picking good investments, doesn't use advanced mathematics. You know, it's kind of simple, pretty simple mathematics, but you have to do it very rigorously. So Aaron mentioned something called the Sharpe ratio here, which is an important number to understand. In finance, one of the ways we measure risk in an investment is volatility. And what volatility really refers to is the standard deviation of the gains and losses, the returns of a stock or any asset. So the Sharpe ratio essentially measures how much return you're getting for the amount of volatility, which in this case represents risk, your portfolio has. Conceptually, you can understand this as the ratio that tells you if your investment is getting a good enough return for the risk you're taking with that investment. 
The way you calculate it is by finding your return in excess of the risk-free return, which is typically what the U.S. Treasuries yield. Then we divide that by the standard deviation of that excess return. This way, you can find out how much return you're getting relative to your portfolio volatility. Exactly. And if the Sharpe ratio is less than one, then that means for every unit of risk you take, in other words, every 1% of volatility you take on in your investments, you make less than 1% in return. This isn't a good thing because your portfolio is more volatile than its return if the Sharpe ratio is less than one. Similarly, if a Sharpe ratio is more than one, then that means for any 1% of volatility you have in your investments, you're making more than 1% in return, which is a good thing as you are earning more than 1% in return for every unit of risk you take. So bottom line, the higher your Sharpe ratio, the better. If two portfolios have the same volatility as each other, then the one with the higher return is the better performing one given the risk. Similarly, if two portfolios have the same return, the one that is less risky, meaning less volatile, is the better performing one because it earned more return given a certain level of risk. Conceptually, that's what the Sharpe ratio is. Now, one of the bigger misconceptions about quantitative finance is that it uses a ton of models. However, that isn't the case, as Aaron briefly explains. The derivative pricing uses models, so that's a big thing. Most of the rest of it is not model heavy. Okay, maybe we can talk about the Black-Scholes model then, because I know that you've worked with Fisher Black before. So what is the Black-Scholes model and how does that work with options pricing? Okay, the Black-Scholes model is not an option pricing model, despite its name. So what the Black-Scholes model does for you is if you have an option and you know the price, it can convert it to an implied volatility. And when you first hear that, you say, what's the point of that? You know, it just takes one thing I don't know and then converts it to something else I don't know. It's very similar to bonds. In a bond, you can take the price of a bond and you can convert it to a yield. And that's exactly what the Black-Scholes model does for options. It takes the price and it converts it to something else. Uh, That turns out to be very useful for a lot of reasons. One of the basic things people look at in fixed income investing with bonds is a yield curve. You say, okay, what is the yield of different bonds at different maturities? And you put it out on a graph. If you put the prices of the bonds against maturity on that graph, it would be a random thing. It wouldn't tell you anything. But yield versus time can be a smooth curve. Similarly, with options, if you graphed option price versus moneyness or time to expiry or any other parameter, you just get random cloud of points. It wouldn't be anything meaningful. But if you graph implied volatility, against any of those things, you can get smooth curves that you can use to predict prices, to make fundamental trades. So the Black-Scholes model is really just a mathematical identity, just like you know taking a bond price and getting a yield. But it's a very useful identity for graphing to figure out kind of the fundamental underlying drivers of a market, also for taking derivatives. If you run a bond portfolio, one of the first things you look at is the duration, the derivative of the value of your portfolio with changes in interest rates. Similarly with options, some of the first things you look at are the Greeks, the derivative of the value of your option portfolio with respect to underlying price, time, interest rates, implied volatility, or other things. Yeah, definitely. And overall, I'd like to understand what misconceptions exist in quantitative finance, because I know that's a topic that a lot of people want to know about. I think the misconceptions mostly come from mashing together different types of quantitative finance. So if you came into a a quantitative equity hedge fund like AQR or many others, DE Shaw, Renaissance, and so on, you would almost certainly be disappointed at the level of math. You would say, you know, these people are just using the simplest math, the most basic ideas. And fundamentally, what you're counting on is diversification, is taking a very small edge and refining it through diversification, through offsetting positions that edge away almost all the risk. So you get a very small gain, but you also get a very small risk, which allows you to lever it up a lot and make good progress. If you compare that to a derivative modeling quant, that's totally different. Those people can use very advanced forms of mathematics and work in a completely different way. And they have generally completely different types of backgrounds. Similarly with high frequency trading shops, again, totally different kind of person, mostly 
much more IT focused. Again, pretty simple math, but very rigorous IT, machine learning, and big data. Again, often very simple kinds of algorithms that don't have a lot of philosophic justification. You know, a naive Bayesian classifier, for example, is a very popular technique for machine learning. And it's, it's so simple, you would look at it and say, this can't possibly work. It's just a stupid idea. It has no good theoretical justification, but it just seems to work remarkably well. So I think a lot of people would come into quantitative finance expecting to see, you know, Einstein's doing, you know, abstract equations and thinking and you know, doodling strange equations. When mostly what you see is people using very workmanlike tools that seem to work and not worrying too much. You have to worry some about why they work and when they might not work, but just much more concerned with results than with theory. You know, you mentioned that you came from like that gambling sort of expertise because you had spent time in Vegas and really studying how that whole thing works. What sort of lessons about risk did you learn that you kind of applied to the financial markets from your gambling days, I guess? Yeah, well, okay. So let's go back. So it's the early 70s and I'm going to Harvard and I'm meeting Fisher Black and Ken Arrow and a bunch of other people who are very influential on my thinking. But I got the general impression, and by the way, a lot of people of my age had kind of similar thoughts. And the way I put it is most of the stuff these people are teaching in quantitative analysis, decision-making under uncertainty, risk management, is stuff nobody would bet a nickel of their own money on. They want to tell everybody else what to do based on their theories, but they never risk their own money on it. So the reason I was driven to gambling is, you know, you go to Las Vegas, you get more independent replications of your idea, a much better test of your idea in one day than you could if you're doing like economics theories with five or 10 years of data. You just learn what works and what doesn't. And the biggest thing is, if your ideas work in Las Vegas, if you're actually making money, then you know it's not because you're clever or because people like you or you did the right thing at the faculty seminar. They're really trying their hardest not to give you money. So if the idea works, it must be really solid. And there are a lot of ideas you pick up doing this. The most fundamental one, and here's where you know finance really diverges sharply from economics. Nearly everything in economics treats risk as something bad. Risk is something you want to minimize. And we called ourselves, this is back, you know, this jumps ahead a little bit to the late 80s. We called ourselves risk managers in the late 80s specifically to distance ourselves from the risk minimizers. But then people kind of jumped into risk management and they brought in the risk minimization attitude. Risk is something good. Risk is how you make money. If the casino never rolled the dice or dealt the cards or if the sports teams never played, there'd be no uncertainty, no risk, and no profits. And risk is something like energy to an engineer. Risk to a finance person is like energy. It can burn you. It can blow you up. It can shock you. But it's absolutely necessary to get done what you want to get done. You know, you can't do be an engineer without harnessing energy. And you can't be in finance without positively harnessing risk. So risk is something good. And this is a key idea. If you want to be successful in finance, you have to think of managing risk, taking the optimal amount of risk, not too much, not too little. So moving on to, I guess, what we now know as quantitative finance as it is today, how does that sort of approach risk management and what sort of aspects of risk are measured with quantitative financial analysis? And I read some of your works online. I I read Financial Risk Management for Dummies that you put out. And you talked about several different types of risks. So I'm I'm wondering, how does quantitative finance in general approach those risks? And which risk do you think it's the most adapted to kind of dealing with? Okay, one of the important principles of risk management is that all risk is one risk. There are an awful lot of people who seem to spend their careers naming risks, slicing and dicing them, saying, okay, we've got this counterparty risk, we've got this liquidity risk, and so on. But all risk is one risk. (laughs) And if you want to manage your risk, you've got to do it holistically with everything. Now, quantitative finance tends to build risk management. So I'm I'm going to call this a a frontline risk management. And this is a broader point. Any risk-taking activity... So whether you're a a football coach, you're a nuclear power plant engineer, you're a financial trader, risk is mostly managed on the front line. 
if your frontline people are not managing their risk, you cannot fix it in the middle office. You can't hire a risk manager to come and fix it. But even if they are managing risk appropriately, they need help from a central organization. And there are some risks that only appear at the institutional level that have to be managed centrally. So in quantitative finance specifically, for the most part, the main risk you're going to be looking at when you're designing into your systems is volatility. And volatility is a very good general measure of risk, especially for the very highly diversified, very liquid portfolios that the quants tend to trade. When you move into other areas, you move into frontier markets, you move into illiquid assets, you move into less diversified portfolios, then the volatility becomes less useful. But volatility does have some issues, and one of them is it assumes that a price is defined. In order to compute a standard deviation of price, there needs to be a price. But in many market scenarios, there is no price. Nobody's trading. There's no liquidity, or the bid-ask spread is so big that you can't really say what the price is. There's just a big range of prices. Or people won't trade with you for some reason, some regulatory issue, some liquidity or credit issue. And all of these things, the very definition of a price goes away. So risk management has to come in and say, okay, what are the situations when there is no price? Or what are the tail risk situations where the financial relationships we count on for the strategy just aren't going to occur? An example we saw in April of 2020 is when oil prices went negative. An awful lot of models, not all models, but a lot of models didn't allow for negative oil prices, and so the model broke. Back in 2008, we had something similar with short-term interest rates. We had inconsistent short-term interest rates, short-term interest rates that, based on fundamental economic principles, should not have existed. But these things do happen. And so you have to say, okay, we've got this algorithm, and this algorithm does a great job, you know, 95% of the time of balancing volatility and taking the right amount of volatility and maximizing growth and doing all the things we want, but it sometimes doesn't work. And so we put in things like drawdown control, we put in stop losses, we have other risk management techniques. And the way I kind of put it is, you know, the quant portfolio designer, the algorithm designer, that person's job is to generate a good long-term sharp ratio. And the risk manager's job is to make sure that the portfolio survives long enough to realize that long-term sharp ratio. You know, one thing I read earlier this year was when the coronavirus pandemic hit and we had that huge sell-off in March, a lot of funds, and I read Renaissance, they didn't expect that to happen and they had quite a big loss. So I'm curious, how does quantitative finance you know, anticipate and you were talking about how it's more about managing risk, not trying to like eliminate risk altogether. So how does it sort of anticipate when risks are at the tail end, so-called black swans? Okay. The pandemic was not a black swan. A black swan is an event that happens because it's unexpected, but we knew about pandemics. You know, we had models predicting how the probability and the size. And I'll tell you, you know, we have a pandemic stress test that I built. This is back in 2018. That's one of the risk management techniques you use, scenario analysis. We say, okay, if there's a pandemic, let's make some assumptions about what would happen. And this is pure coincidence, by the way, but it turned out the pandemic size that we used in that scenario analysis was almost exactly what happened in 2020. You don't really care about that. You know, when you do a pandemic scenario, you're not really doing it to plan against a pandemic. The thing about scenario analysis is there's an infinite number of things that can happen, and you can't possibly prepare scenarios for each of them and decide what you're going to do. But there's only a fairly small, finite number of ways that these things work out that, you know, whether it's a pandemic or a blizzard or an earthquake or an asteroid hitting the earth or aliens appearing on the White House lawn, what matters for your financial institution, for your trading, are things like your cash position, your ability to trade, regulatory actions, asset prices, and so on. So if you prepare for a pandemic, it can help you prepare for any number of other things that happen that disrupt markets, that change prices, that change regulations, that disrupt your operations. Now, when you're planning for the pandemic in the scenario analysis, you're not looking to maximize profits. You're looking to survive it. 
So you're asking people, what would you do? You're making sure that everybody knows what the plan is, that the right people will have the right information to make the decisions, that the decisions will represent what people thought in calm times, not what people did in the heat of the moment. And this is what you do. You generally speaking, and this is not always true, but generally speaking, quant funds are going to lose when something kind of happens out of left field. And so the pandemic, well, although I said a pandemic was expected, we knew there was a probability of this happening. You know, we probably would have said, okay, in the next 25 years, there's going to be one event of this size, but we don't necessarily expect it to show up in March of 2020. If you protect yourself against anything you can imagine, you're going to spend so much money on that, you're going to hurt yourself more than helping yourself. Generally speaking, quants make their money when the normal thing happens. Quants are the people betting on the favorite. And yeah, we know sometimes an outsider wins. You know, 24 years out of 25, there's no pandemic and the quants make a dollar. One year out of 25, there's a pandemic and the quants lose $10, but they're still making money net. Other people are too afraid or too likely to try to protect themselves against these events. There's a very profound thing Nassim Taleb says that people should remember. He says, look, most of the time, nothing happens. Tomorrow is like today. No big news. People make news, they yell and scream, they worry about things, they have, you know, headlines, but, but, you know, none of it really matters. Most of the time, nothing happens. But when something does happen, it's much bigger than what people expect. So, you know, if you say if something has a standard deviation of one, most people tend to sort of bet that the movement will be about one. People tend to assume that the most likely thing to happen is an average sized move, but average sized moves are very rare. If the standard deviation is one, most of the time you get a move of less than 0.3 or so, much smaller move than average. But if you do get a move, it's going to be a 10 or a 20. So people who spend their lives preparing for a move of one are just almost always wrong. So quants are the people betting, yeah, there's nothing's going to happen or something big will happen. And when you get like a moderately big disruption, like the pandemic, that tends to be an environment in which quants lose. Hey everyone, that was the end of part one of our two-part interview with Aaron Brown on simplifying quantitative finance. We'll be releasing part two of our interview in about two weeks from when this releases. But the first half of the conversation was absolutely incredible. Alex, what were some of the takeaways from this first part? One takeaway is that quantitative finance is different from, yet also similar to more traditional finance. It's different in its approach to finance and investing, choosing to focus more heavily on diversification and numbers as opposed to a qualitative fundamental approach. Really, quantitative finance is unique in its approach by focusing on the data and numbers. But the end goal in quantitative finance is the same as that for all businesses, making a profit. Yeah, and despite its name, quantitative finance isn't super complicated math. Derivative pricing may include some kinds of advanced math, but the actual investment part of quantitative finance uses relatively basic math that is applied in different situations. And like all things in finance, the application of that quantitative analysis is what matters. If you find some technique that works, then it works. It doesn't matter how mathematically complex it is, as long as it gets the job done. Exactly. And another takeaway is in how quantitative finance approaches risk management. Aaron explained it quite well, that risk isn't necessarily a bad thing because you can use it to your advantage to profit. You must view risk as something to manage, not eliminate entirely. And that has implications for how quantitative finance funds, in general, will perform. Agreed. Well, Alex, that wraps up our part one conversation and takeaways. What can we expect from part two? We'll be talking more about quantitative finance concepts, careers in quantitative finance, Aaron's career and his advice, and much more. Part two will be dropping on April 15th, which is two weeks from now. We'll talk to you all then. Hey guys, I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. It truly means the world to us. If you like this episode and others, let us know by subscribing and giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts and following us on Spotify. Share us with your friends and check us out on Instagram and Twitter, both at StreetFins. You can also follow me on Twitter at Rohan Invest. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please email fspodcast at streetfins.com. Thanks once again to Aaron Brown for his insights today. I hope you understand the topic of quantitative finance in a more simplified way. Once again, we're really happy that you're taking the initiative to learn finance and to better your future. 
If you haven't already, we highly encourage you to check out streetfins.com for articles, videos, and other content. Join the Streetfins community and tell your friends about us so that they can learn about finance too. We'll talk to you next time on Finance Simplified.